without further ado, Evange Shrapwani. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I don't need to say my name, but at least I need to say my advisor. I mean, my supervisor and my next one. So we worked on this framework together, and it's like a, compile, a programming language or a compiled framework where we try to build languages like that, just like pizza. So, pizza is great. Uh, so, yeah. So, how many of you have ever asked or wished this? Everybody, right? Well, in the case of Scala, you say, the oldest feature, maybe, right? Because Scala is brought it. But I mean, in other languages, we say, oh, Java with pattern matching would be awesome, maybe. So, in case you have ever asked, I mean, wished this, I think you are in the right place. So everybody has his own perfect language. There is no perfect language, right? I mean, for me, a perfect language is like, I mean, we have in general perfect languages like Scala, like Java. They all like something or has have too many features, something like this. So if we add or remove some features that we dream of, we end up having our dream language, right? Scala without the place, yay! So, Everybody, I mean, there are lots of people th thinking about this, and there are lots of approaches to, to do it. I mean, macros, you can extend the language with some features. Even aspects, for example, Spring is like using aspects heavily and extends the JavaScript capability somehow. Um, you have accessible language frameworks, they are more, I mean, more serious frameworks, and there's like just add and polyglot, there are. Have you ever heard about Xten, for example? Xten is a, concur a concurrency like, oriented programming language and it's it's totally different from Java, but it's built on Java compiler somehow. So another way is accessible compilers like in Scala, we can plug in plug ins into Scala compiler and add features to it, right? I mean So, but if you look at these, they all add features to the language. I mean, there, there is no way to remove features from some language, for example, it's kind of like this. So, you vote for this, okay? And so, what if we want to do this? Well, fortunately, we have addressed this, and we have a framework that lets you add features to a language or remove features from a language. Uh, but this is a bit of lie because we don't remove it, we just don't include it. So, but, but we will explain it later. So, traditional compilers, they are either like accessible compilers or non accessible <coughs> compilers. They, they are all incremental, they are like one core, there are some phase built on top of it, another phase, for example, type. By checking it on top of it, so everything like depends on each other. There are lots of coupling between them. And if you have not me, I said some phase, right? Not some feature, because one compilation phase is like the smallest component in a compiler that rarely you can like break it down into smaller pieces. So the 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 smallest unit in traditional compilers are really too big. We don't want this. Instead, I mean, if you look at this again, this is like the common architecture of a compiler. You feed some string, you parse it, you get some ASTs, you assign symbols to them, maybe. Uh, then some main resolution is done. Then typing. I mean, they, they are all incremental, right? Everything depends on the phase before it, and they are all like one problem. <coughs> so, but can we do better? I mean, let's have, I mean, in the dream lab, it will be like we'll have like small components, like labor pieces, and connect them together with this one combination phase for type checking, another one for name resolution, right? This would be perfect if you can do that. So that's where Sana comes 
And it's a fully modular and accessible framework for building programming languages. And yeah, as I said, you can add features to the ready languages that it provides or remove features from them, as we show later. And unlike traditional compilers, our smallest comp components uh, are not, I mean, our smallest units are not phase, uh, compilation phases, but instead some part of a compilation phase. So we will focus on the last point now. Let's say, I mean, if you look at this, you said we have parsing, name resolution, symbol assigning at all this. So let's look at this. I mean, that's how Sana works. We have like some, I guess, you know what's this, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, every everything in programming language is expressed in some three kind of tree, right? One for let's say default definitions, one for variable definition, identifier, everything. So in traditional, actually, I need a point here. Okay, I don't have to. Can you see that? The remote is a laser pointer. Ah, okay. The laser button. Oh, cool. So, so, if you look at naming, this is like a compilation phase, and in traditional compilers, we provide <coughs> one naming as one unit for every possible ASD. But in SANA, in C, we provide one simple component that does naming for all these lambda expressions, and that's it. It doesn't know anything else. Then another one, it does performance type checking for lambda expressions, and that's it, nothing else. So all the components are really, really focused. So we will have lots of a sea of components. You see every X is like a, a component that performs some, something for one kind of phase. So now, if I just combine it, I mean, cherry pick some of this, and some of this, and some of this, and some here, I will end up having my own language which has like, not all the features of the previous language, right, the base language, but some of the features of that. Of course, I need to be some, somehow careful that, for example, you cannot have a language with, with classes without identifiers, because this doesn't make any sense, right? Because you need some identifier to point out, to point to the class, for example. But I mean, as long as you are, you are doing sensible things, then it should be really straightforward. So, do you have any questions on this? Because this is the core of my talk. Is this the same idea as nanopass compilers? I not really. In not nanopass, you have like one one phase, and this phase transforms the AS into another type of AS. So that, um, they are really, really small too, but the idea is a bit different because a phase is like still one component and works on all the ASTs. So somehow it's different. What is naming? Naming is just, well, when you have like an identifier and you have just parsed this, I mean, when you have a program and it has an identifier, like a variable name, and this variable name doesn't know to which variable definition it belongs to, I mean, it points to, right? So name, naming does name resolution for you. It tells you this identifier points to that, I, I, I mean, that definition. Is it like a link the variable to its type? Exactly, to its definition. So be it type, be it variable definition or whatever. So you say you have to be at least basically careful of this. Does the framework Tell me if I'm not being careful, or do well, I Well, I mean, we haven't implemented this because this is really tricky, and you, you were funded for this. <laughs> so, but I mean, it, it's always a good idea to have this, but it's not easy. So, yeah. uh, my question is, uh, <clears throat> what is the purpose finally of that? I mean, uh, okay, if you want to do your own, language of the which what 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 brings what, what, what is the game? Well what let's, is an idea I just want to understand what is useful for Well let's say you have a company and you want to build a language because I mean what every company 
Uh, yes, so maybe. maybe. Yeah. You, there are two ways to go for it. Either you build some, I mean, your DSF from scratch and you have to do everything, or just build it on top of another ready language just with some modification that you get your own, right? And DSLs, I mean, there are lots of use cases for DSLs, right? So, so what is the advantage? I just want to understand. Sorry. What is the gain? What is the gain of this? You, you write less code. You will hopefully have less bug because you write less code. So, and at least your first prototype will be. I'm not sure you write less code. Because I'm sure mm -hmm. it's how you can do your DSL less code. Well, but they are. I mean, they are bound to what Scala provides, and you can never, like, I mean, remove features from Scala, for example, right? You don't yeah, want your DSL to have everything. If you build your DSL, for example, you can define a model, and from that model, you do the DSL. So all yeah, but maybe your DSL, you don't want to have variables. variables. Maybe you, you don't want to have variables, I mean, immutable variables in your DSL. But you cannot do that. You just continue. It's just yes. it's okay. So let's show a small demo because it's easier. Yeah. So yeah, let's say we have. So let's say we want to build a, a programming language. Um, yeah. You can see it, right? Okay. Can you see what I'm typing? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. So, okay, I, I want to build a language to have multiplication and, and addition. Oh. Okay, so it like does this one plus one or one maybe one, I mean, it's a very simple language, okay? And then I want to change my language, build another language with without multiplication. So I will end up having this as a valid expression, this as non-valid expression. So just to give things up, this is language one. This is two. Okay? So we will do something like this, and I want to show how easy it is. Okay? Uh, I mean, I, I know the language is really, really small, small, small and like not challenging. You can do it, do it in Scala without maybe this much of code, but you can apply the same logic with more complex languages. So, in order to build a multiplication, I need an ASC node. Actually, in order to have like some notion of integers, to express integers, I have an ASC node, I call it infinite, and another ASC node for addition, I call it addition, add, I mean, another one for multiplication. So, I, I will have my ASCs, then I, I build like type checker for integers, type checker for additions, type checker for multiplication. Then, just because it's nice to have it, I, I will have like some pretty printers for multiplications, additions, and integers. Then I will implement the simple language and the, the bigger language. So, for the ASCs, they are just normal face classes and traits and nothing special about them. It did, int lit or int teacher default has like some value in it. It's int basically. Uh, just to, to, so, so we know what values it denotes. Uh, for additions, it it has like two sides, like every addition node should have like the left hand and the right hand side of it. So we will have like two expressions in the right and left hand side. Then the same thing for multiplications. I know we can we could have the same the same node, but I just wanted to have two. 
So because we have type checking, I also introduce types. I mean, they are still fairly straightforward. Some object for no type, another one for integer type, and one for error type on the codes of the error. So, so far, so easy. What's no type for? Sorry again? What is no type for? <laughs> uh, before type checking, everything has no type. Because it's not resolved. We, we, I'm not sure if we use it. Maybe we do. Yeah. We do it here. So, uh, if you look at this, if this is my language, and I want to build a compiler, I mean, I've given this AST, and I want to build a compiler when something goes wrong, it tells me, points me to the source, I mean, the source code tells me, at this line, this column, you have this error. So, if you look at these ASCs, they, they have zero information about the source code, right? You want to add it. One way to add it is just extend some field position, right? But then if I want to add something else, like symbols to it, okay, add symbols to it too. Then what about symbols have owners, maybe? Oh, add this too. So I have to like forecast everything that happens in the future and add them, right? So this is not good. One way is to cheat and pretend that you are type safe, but not, and have some attribute which is like, I mean, from string to any. So um, I know, I know, it's ugly, ugly. But the interface is not. We will show you. <laughs> so it's just like some really, really ugly stuff that nobody is supposed to see, except, <laughs> except when you extend it. When you extend it, using a priest class, something really, really my common is color. I hate in this class still, but we <laughs> <laughs> So, for example, I want to add types to it. So I just have like some set that I get that does this set attribute and get attribute. You know, so I can extend my classes myself. This is ugly. I, I, but I mean, if you want to do it in, I mean, this extensible or open classes, there were no better ways that we could think of this, at least in Scala. Maybe in C sharp we could have used partial classes, I don't know. But well actually partial classes wouldn't have worked because we we could have like some source code which is already compiled and our source code is not compiled then we cannot use partial classes too. So do you have any questions on this ugliness of my <laughs> I am not proud of this part, but I wanted to be like honest and short. Yeah. Okay. But nobody had complained about this. Yeah. So so far nothing was like really, really special about my compiler. I mean my framework. Everything was like just normal normal compiler and compiler frameworks. But now the interesting part comes, which is transformation components. These transformation components are the basic parts of every compilation phase. So instead of having one type check one type checking phase, we have like one type checking component or one transformation component, which is a type checking component for let's say integer default. Another one for addition. But before we get into this, have you ever like thought about partial functions and pattern matching are they close to each other? I think yes, right? Partial functions, we have case-based things and we do actions. Let me show you. So, so if I have like expression match case int lit do stuff one, then so this is a fairly simple pattern matching in style. 
Now, if I want to, I mean, if I've given this, and I want to extend, I mean, I want to change the priority between, I mean, add, yeah, if I, I have by some class which extends, I mean, this is in another source called maybe another library at all. Okay, so we don't have access to the previous one, let's say. So this is some third party libraries. So if I have something mature add which extends let's say add. Okay, not more things. And I want to have priority for mature add over the the add over there, and every time we have mature add, let's say, I mean, I, I want to add mature add here. We all agree that it's impossible to do with pattern matches, right? But if you use partial functions, <coughs> is it? So partial functions is like almost the same. If we have this instead, well, let's say case one. This is one partial function. Well, case two. Another part. part. You see, it's really similar, right? So now, if I say case one dot or else, case two dot or else, case three. This is one implementation. Another implementation I can add here, my own addition, while case four, which is actually in this. Right? It's uh, that way I can add my own, I mean, like inject my own priority, I mean, my own case, I mean. So we use this idea to implement our like component, I mean, Lego like uh, implementation. So yeah, I mean, if you look at Scala's source code, for example, for the compiler, it's all like this. I mean, every face is one huge pattern matching. If this is the case, then do this for that. If this is the case, do this for that. So you can never break it down into pieces, right? But in our language, we in C use something similar to this. So you end up having lots of partial functions, and you just need to do them up. Is there any advantage to do that uh, versus using type classes or something? Well, no. I mean, maybe not. We, uh, I tried to implement this in Haskell. Okay. Uh, the type classes were okay for me. I I did them with type classes, and it was good. But I, I thought I needed like some subtitle, so it wasn't the type classes that prevented me from doing it. It was a subtyping that I, I needed in my implementation that prevented me from implementing it in Haskell. So in theory, no. The type classes does the same thing. But in Haskell, in Scala, the type classes that we, it provides is not as good as the type class that Scala, Haskell provides. That's why we didn't use that type class. I mean, it, Scala just pretends that they have type class, but they don't. <laughs> well, it works. Huh? It still works. Oh. Well, I mean, it's weird, it's heavy, so, yeah. So, yeah. So, like I said, we use this idea <coughs> when 
Yeah, old TV is like that. <laughs> yeah. So, I, in order to implement a type checking, I mean, a type checking phase, again, I have nothing, just a simple trait, which implements this transformation component, which is basically a partial function with some more, like, utility functions. And it has one method that we use heavily. It's called typed. This type should know, or eventually will know, how to type check every expression and, and uh, like, returns a type check expression or some non-type checkable expression that that's like unsound. So whenever we call type, we are guaranteed that it will succeed. succeed. Okay, so I mean that it will be able to type check it. Either it produces some ill-typed expression or some well-typed expression. <laughs> to create the parser function for the integer return, uh, we use some macro to transform this to like the apply and the is defined at method for us. So it's nothing, just some expansion, macro expansion. And yeah, for integer return, we, does, we don't do anything. We just say every integer return has type integer. Yeah, so unexpected. Yeah. So we don't have problems here, right? So integer return was easy. I mean, uh, type, type checking for it was easy. But for addition, it's a bit more involved because we have like two ex sub expressions of it and we have to type check them too. So as I said, the type method in the, in the like, extended trait well, tra has, I mean, it is guaranteed to be able to type check everything, right? So we rely on this guarantee and we just type check the left hand side and right hand side of an expression. And if they were both integers, then of course a, a, an addition for two integers like results in an integer, right? So we just do this silly type checking and if everything is like this, then integer, otherwise some error. Very straightforward, right? Except from the Fact part that I will explain later. Again, this is a, a macro and it expands to a uh, really long partial function definition. Yeah. So, so far we have only created two components, and for multiplication, you can't do the same. It's the same thing, except we just say instead of add here and here, we just say mod because it's the same structure, right? So, yeah, now we have like two components, and if you want to create a compilation unit or a compilation phase, uh, sorry, out of these two components or these three, let's say, pretend we had by multiplication group, then what we would do is we just extend some transformation family, which again has some helper functions for us. Um, Yeah, actually, I'm not using the help of functions in the transformation family, but I just enlightened it here because I want to show. Uh, so what I do, I mean, first I have a list of all the components that I want to include. I just say my compilation phase includes a compilation phase for integer literals. I mean, uh, sorry, I want to say that my type checking phase includes a type checking for integer literals, a type checking for addition, and a type checking for multiplication. So I just list all the names that I have. Sorry again, this is a macro, and the macros don't support anything else apart from sitting literals. I hate it, but we couldn't do it otherwise. I couldn't pass types to it. I know this is not type safe, but we are about to start coming with this. Then this is like, if you look at the name of the add type of component and int which which is the name of the 
of the ASCT hyper component, you see the like, I mean, they both share the hyper component, right? This was, it was intentional, I didn't tell you, sorry, because I just said, I mean, it's just like expand this, add this hyper component to everything. Uh, I, I know, I, I could just write a longer name to them and be less lazy, but I, I, I was lazy, sorry. And I just, again, pass the, the name of the function that that is like connecting the, everything together. That, 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 I mean, the function that I, I told you can like type check everything. I guarantee that type check everything. And how does this work? Actually, we have this. I just connect everything using or else. I mean, all the components that are here, they they say, I mean, using this like sequence, I mean, the same sequence, it just says, okay, well, uh, the type checker for this, or else the type checker for that, or else the type checker for that. So if you want to add your own language with one less, let's say, feature, you just don't include this here. And you'll still have the same, the same result. I mean, you'll have a, a, a language with, with one less feature. So, yeah, as I, I said, this is like a type checking for three components, three like nodes, right? Three types, three A's nodes. And if I want to have type checking for like only multiplication and and addition, then I, I just say, I just say, I just say, okay, don't include this. And I will have it. And actually, we, we can just ignore, I mean, to say well it wasn't sorry, it wasn't that great so we can't extend objects but still I mean you understand how not so difficult it is to remove like features from it right we just don't include them as I said we we it's not like we we remove them no we just don't <coughs> include them we have lots of Lego pieces and we just connect the ones that we are interested in. So, do you get this? Yeah. The generic component, is it a function that you wrote? Or? It's a macro again. Generic component is a macro, it just generates all this, I mean, expands this. Why we use macros? Because, I mean, macro is run before type checking, so we can somehow type check it, you know? It, it complains if, for example, a combination of add and type checker didn't exist. I mean, the type of component didn't exist. So that's why we use this. Could you have passed a list as the first? Well, macros don't, I mean, we cannot expand lists, so that's why we couldn't do that. I actually, I wanted to pass arrays because it's a bit better than strings, but again, because arrays are, I mean, not digital. I mean, well, they are somehow literal in Scala, but not during compilation time, so that's why they could, I, I couldn't use the iteration. So, questions? Well, because this was like the hardest part. If no questions here, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm almost on that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, after this, it's fairly easy to, uh, I mean, now I have, the type of components, you you can see it, how easy it is to implement pretty printer because we all have the, almost the same structure, because, but we, instead of this, we just have a, a two string code, I mean, a print line two string code, right? I mean, depending on, on your pretty printing thing, for me, pretty printing is <laughs> So, yeah, for addition, we, we can have the same. I, I, I just, then I mean, exclude this because they are just repetition for what we have on here. 
Um, yeah, we can have the same family for both languages, the smaller and the bigger language. And I think this is not so difficult, right? So now how can we create a compiler? Again, it's really simple. We just say an expression language extends language module, which is like a, a module we, we provide and it just creates the compiler for you. I mean, provides the compilation things, but you have to just implement the compile method. And it's just like saying, uh, type and family, type the method that, I mean, the magic method that we talked about. Compose, this joint is just like compose with some extra functionalities, with like the printer printer, let's say, with pprint. So you can list all your compilation phases like this, and the main, the entry point for every compilation phase, and you have your compiler. Uh, I, I know this might be like look really too much work to do, but believe me, this is easier than implementing it from scratch, you know? Well, not for this language, uh, but for mm -hmm. real languages it is, and I'll show you why. Just before we continue, if I want, I mean, if I want to, can you see this? Yeah. Okay, it's really small. I, I I just want to show you that, I mean, when writing it, it's really easy to write, but when running some, I mean, compiling something on it, it's a bit heavy on the CPU. Um, for example, for a simple like addition, add, I mean, adding one plus two plus three, yeah, one plus two plus three, it needs all these like going and coming from different components to different to the compilation, uh, um, to the compilation phase until it's done. Type check. So don't expect it to be too performant. Actually, it is not too performant. It's not terrible, but it's good. <laughs> yeah, use this for prototyping. Don't use this for production unless you write Java <laughs> compiler. Because believe me, I wrote the full Java compiler and it was faster than Scala's compiler. Yeah, but it's not. No, 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 difficult to beat and start a compiler's performance. Everybody can do that. So, yeah, if you look at Sana, the framework, it provides like some core language, which we call it tiny, and it provides only the infrastructure and shapes the compiler, but it doesn't provide anything special. Then we have like some macros like these general components and component and these just are there for eliminating boilerplate. They don't do any magic. Um, again, we have like a, a single based, simple table based compiler skeleton with some base uh, basic ASCs. For example, every three, a, every AST should extend three, surprisingly. Then some base type and some error handling and like uh, error reporting and debugging facilities. So the core of the framework is really small. And I think it's like about around 700 lines, something like this, so it's nothing big. But yeah, I think I appoint some of you today because we didn't use too much money, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we use special functions, uh, function compositions. I think this is good, right? Then yeah, macros. Please, sorry again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm a bad guy. As music. Yeah. So yeah, I know this about functional programming too. That's why I included the one. But believe me, it was only option like or this is nothing too. I mean, too deep. So to evaluate our code, I created a full Java compiler, like version one, which is almost like version eight with some minor changes. <laughs> yeah, I mean Java never grows, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, I because Java is big, and we didn't want to implement the whole Java at once because it defeats our purpose. We first implemented some. I mean, uh, we first implemented. Uh, yeah, I, I told you that the tiny is like 700 lines, right? So, yeah. 
And for the compiler, we first implemented some calculator part of Java, which is like the plus, the, the minus, I mean, the binary operations, the unary operations, and, and booleans, logic operations, integers, I mean, these primitives. So, yeah, and this was like 939 lines of code, so it was big. But it, it had all the, the things that we needed for this, for example, I mean, for this part of the Java, for example, type checking, we didn't need name resolution for it because there were no name in it, right? We didn't have variables, so why we should have name resolution? But we had something else, for example, uh, I, I think I exclude the parts of here, but it had like some, yeah, it had some faces, for example, called generation and those, yeah. That's why it's a bit weak. Then we implemented the primitive part of Java, so far so good. <laughs> for example, the function, I mean, fun, methods, but it, they were not methods because they were not inside classes, but they were just like functions in other languages. So we can call them functions because we didn't have, I mean, all the static functions outside the classes, or so whatever you call them. Uh, with like methods and I think like code constructors like if else and those and we implemented we here needed to implement name resolution, right? So we we need two thousand lines of code. So we like this and everything. I mean I added like new features to it uh, incrementally. Yeah, one of them is broken gene because Java breaks here, which adds break. Yeah. This was a mistake. I mean break and continue. So yeah. Uh, yeah, some. I mean, for, for example, here we have functions, but we don't have we don't have functions. I mean, methods, right? But here we have methods, but we don't have functions. So one way is to just rewrite another function. I mean, method component and do everything. Another way was just to reuse what, what we already have and add things to it. And, that's of course what we did. I mean, we just reused what we have here and add some constraints to them, and bingo, we went. Uh, yeah. And sometimes I think in more, yeah. I mean, I think in robust J when we add try catch, we needed to again modify the functions because there we changed the signature of the functions now with potential to, like. Throws clouds, right? So um, here we had arrays, but if you look at this, I mean, this 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 is built on top of broken J, which which has no no object orientation. And if you know in Java, arrays extend object, but this array didn't extend object because it was a completely different language. Now it's not a Java array, right? But here, in ARR or OJ, which is a rouge, <laughs> yeah, we, we just combine the, these two faces together and eliminate some parts from array J and add some parts. <coughs> I mean, because now our arrays need to like extend Java objects. So we use this feature removing like facility at least here. So at least it was useful for us when we built Java compiler. And the overall compiler was like 19k lines of code. I think it's not terrible for something that, I mean, because we, we are even, more, I mean, we like eliminated too many features. You know, we were building it then because we changed the language then and we wanted it to be accessible. I think the, the lines of code is resolvable. So now we have like many components here for type checking, for name resolution, for code generation, and like, etc. We wanted to build other languages on top of it, right? To prove that we, we do something like useful. And we picked an obscure language called Oberon Zero. It's like Pascal, but we, I mean, a limited, a limited Pascal. And 
that we fix the the most basic part of it because we only wanted to evaluate that nobody is interested in writing code in our languages. Yeah. Well, I wrote one one file. I mean, one program which did not which did not make it exactly. Yeah. So Ogre is completely different from Java. Let's see what I mean. We, we I mean in Java arrays don't have I mean the array type doesn't have a size right. When you define a method that takes an array, it doesn't specify what should be the size of it. In Ogre, no, we have sizes. So this is one difference. Another difference: type aliasing doesn't exist in Java. It is in uh, I mean it is in Ogre. Uh, type inter inference, of course, Java lacks it, but it's except for some cases in generics. Um, in Opera, we have it only for constant variables, so important. I mean, yeah. Then we have some structural subtyping in Opera. We have like nominal subtyping in Java. We see what we are we are extending in Java, right? So in in Opera, we don't have any object like superclass of everything. In Java, we do. Uh, methods in Java can be overloaded, in uh, Overland cannot be. So if you look at it, it's really, really different. And I still could implement the whole thing in only one, uh, around 1,000 lines of code. So, I, I mean, I just had to make the changes, right? I didn't need to re-implement everything in order to implement the Overland zero. Actually, this was like a challenge that was made, I think, in 2006, if I'm not mistaken. Back then, I was doing my bachelor, so I was in the challenge, and I—I I mean, the results. I mean, I did my—I mean, my, my, I mean, I like did the did my work in 2016. So this is like 10 years after, but I still could beat them. I mean, everybody who was like building this over zero using their own frameworks. After 10 years, I beat them. Yeah. So, oh yeah. Another thing, and she talked about it like two months ago, I think, right? It's the previous Scala meetup to me. Yeah, time class. So it's like a DCCT language, it's a dynamically, uh, dynamic, and it's, it sounds for distributed. Well, that doesn't the, the data set types, right? Yes. So she wrote it. She wrote it, not me. And she had, I mean, she, well, it was like a joint work, but she had to learn the framework. And she could learn the framework in less than a month, I think, right? And started using it. Uh, so again, this is a different language. It doesn't have, it doesn't have, it has dictionaries like Python but not arrays. Uh, it has records with constructors. I don't know what this is. I mean it's like struct with with constructors Makes but sense. not classes. Yeah, but it's not class. I mean it's something in between, you know? Yeah it, they don't have it, well because it's it's not class, they don't have inheritance. Then the primitives are different than what we have in Java. So again, the language is different. And what's I think the type checker is done, and most of the parts are done. But it's still the language is not finished. But what is there is like still under what, one thousand lines of code. But still, it was a completely different language. Uh, and yeah. So we are doing well when it comes to lines of code. Let's see how we are doing when it comes to performance. Not so good. Well, not so terrible too. So I compiled the Java 1 library, which is like 14,000 lines of code with my machine. You saw how terrible it was like seven, several minutes ago, it didn't start. So yeah, this is the the progress of it. And yeah, I used 2011 Java, uh, I mean Scala with JVM 1.8. I 
I run like the compiler on this library for five times and I record the average which was like 16 seconds to compile the whole library and generate the bytecode, of course. But unfortunately, unfortunately maybe, Java's compiler can do it in 2.5 seconds. I am ashamed, but not too much, because when Scala compiles main source with this 25,000 lines of code, it, it would have taken like, it, it was taking like one minute or something like this sometimes with SBT overhead. So I, I am being terrible when it comes to performance, but not as bad as uh, SBT. So, but I mean, after all, our compiler wasn't optimized at all. We didn't aim for performance, we aimed for accessibility. Um, I think it's it's not terrible. Uh, I am not too unhappy about something like this. So, if you are interested, the source code is available here in the, my GitHub account. And yeah. Thank you.